Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our back in our Father's Word, the book of James. James in the Greek is the equivalent of Jacob in the Hebrew, the father of the 12 tribes. And chapter 1, verse 1 of James is addressed to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So this is one of those books that you definitely, as always, have three levels. And we're going to try to cover all three of them for whatever ear hears, it will fall on that level. In this fourth chapter, we're talking about the tongue. Uh, a man's tongue is one of the most, the toughest things to control that there is. Because sometimes it goes into action before the brain kicks in gear. And that's called a ratchet jaw. And certainly um, you want to be able to spot a ratchet jaw. Uh, and be able to mark them well because you'll never learn anything from them. And just as a small, as we closed in the last lecture, just as a small fire in a deep forest will start a huge raging inferno, so can lies come in from the tip of a tongue. It can really, false information can cause a lot of problems. Such as in the last lecture, I, I um, had mentioned that um, Rahab was called a harlot. And then I miraculously turned that over to Hagar. I mean, now that takes some doing, but when you've got a super teacher, that can happen, see? So always check your teacher out. Naturally, it is Rahab, uh, uh, and um, she was no harlot. She was a businesswoman and unfortunately derived a reputation from man, God has never called Rahab a harlot. Only men did because of their jealousy because she, could, she made better linen than they did. Anyway, the tongue can mislead even by accident if you're not careful. So always try to control that. We'll pick it back up in chapter 3, verse 10, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. Verse 10 reads, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. That just shouldn't happen. You know. you, if you are a mature adult and you are a purveyor, and of course, what is the subject here? It's concerning teachers, being a master teacher or not, and churches. It, it should not be in a church. Okay? Just There's no room for that. Verse 11 that they fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Nope, it's all, it's going to be the same. Okay. 12, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Question, either a vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. It's just not going to happen. This is how you can always judge a person by listening to them about five minutes and weigh what they say with understanding, be slow to answer, and you will learn a lot about that person And um, because God gives you the gift of discernment if you follow him. And you will know immediately uh, from which it's sweet or sour whether it's truth or fiction is the actual uh, meaning. Verse 13, who is a wise man? Now listen carefully. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness, that's humility, of wisdom. And, and so it is. Do you, know how, do you know how you can tell this? It's real easy to spot how you can spot a person that has wisdom and humility, and that wisdom naturally is in the Word of God with a, a clear understanding of the manuscripts, of the Scriptures. 
You know how you can tell what a wise person is? They will never, never, never take credit for the word themselves. They will always, the subject is a master teacher, they will always give credit to Almighty God. Do you know why? Because God is the author. It is God's word, it's not ours. So naturally, a master teacher with wisdom bringing forth the word of God will always give God the credit. You can count on it. That's an ace in the hole as far as spotting a good teacher. Wisdom, true wisdom, wisdom from Almighty God. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. That's the Lord. What's the truth? The Lord's the Word. That is the truth. And when you start twisting the Word around, you're twisting Him around. That's not intelligent. If you want to get your gourd thumped, that's a good way to do it. Well, I just wanted to try that little thing out. Well, you better try it out in your own mind and put a little fleece out concerning it. By that I mean give it a little test before you lay it on somebody else. Then that, because when you lay it on somebody else, that makes you a false teacher. God corrects false teachings. Verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. In other words, strife, envying, trouble, it doesn't come from above. Let me say it again, you do not get it from God's Word. You get it from simply fleshly lust, personal feelings, well, it just hurt my feelings. Well, tough stuff, okay? That can happen sometimes. Stick with God's Word, stick with the truth. I don't care whether it offends you or not, you stay with truth and be blessed because that's the only way you'll ever have blessings from God is to teach His truth, giving Him the credit and not adding anything uh, fleshly or from below, but teach that that is from above, that meaning from your Father. Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. All you're going to have is commotion. Peace of mind comes from loving Almighty God, accepting the Son, and living this Word. That brings you peace of mind, because why? Well, you're eternal bound. You've, you've got heaven made, an, an eternity of peace, of blessings, of riches, of understanding. I mean, how fortunate can you be to be blessed in that light? That's having it made. So don't waste your time with envying strife and confusion in this fleshly old world because all flesh is going to be gone at the seventh trump. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above, we're from above, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. In other words, there's no wrangling or, or, or wavering. It's always straight on. Simplicity as Christ would teach it, easily understood. You know, many might say, well, why is it you have so many children below 10 years old even that enjoy studying chapter by chapter and verse by verse? Because it's simple. If you will throw, a, throw out all the old retrap, uh, re, retreads from recaps of this religion, that religion, and something else, traditions of men that make void the Word of God, and simply listen to the teachings of Christ, the true Word from above, children enjoy it. They love it. Why? Because it gives them, it gives them direction, common sense, and God's blessings. It doesn't get much better than that. How precious it is to be loved of Almighty God and receiving His blessings. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness 
is sown in peace of them that make peace. The subject is teachers, and when teachers sow peace, it will bring peace. It will, it, it, those that uh, wish to rabble rouse will not be interested in peace. Why? Because if you give God all the credit, there's no room for someone to selfishly want to be a bigwig. Okay. Because only our Father is on the throne with the Son. Doesn't need a man there. And the Word flows pure and simple. And the pattern of truth understanding and sensibility flows forever in the minds of the people over the buds of the mind that want that peace of mind which comes only through Christ. Again, the subject is teachers and churches. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. From whence came wars and fightings among you? How, how did that happen? Come they not hence? even of your lust, that war in your members. In other words, all that trouble you have in that congregation, it sure didn't come from God. But brother, you don't understand. I've got to be the most important. Oh, do you? How about letting Father's Word be the most important? How about letting our Father? Why don't you love Him and understand He's what's important? Verse 2, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. Well, well now, wait a minute. Uh, what do you mean ask? You've got to ask the Father. Ask him for peace. Ask him for understanding and seek it in his letter of love that he has written to you, whereby with flowing and understanding, it unfurls itself in the, your very mind, giving you that peace of mind and stability that one needs. That's what a church should have. In this world, you are always, Satan will always try to destroy a good work. Don't ever let that happen. It is the responsibility of the congregation to close the hedge, teach the truth, and bless, let God bless the people. Verse 3, you ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Your, your um, self-righteous, hypocritical importance, uh, your own little lust to be somebody, something. You, you don't ask for the real truth and the blessings of God that flow and give God the credit, not yourself, God the credit for bringing forth that truth. And don't ask just for self-pleasure to say, boy, boy, I did this, that's mine. No, it isn't. It belongs to our Father, always. And I do mean always. Verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses. The ancient manuscripts drops the word adulteresses, only adulterer. And it means an idolater, a teacher that is supposed to teach God's word and, and not be an idolater of teaching false teachings. That's what it's talking about. Uh, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You've got to understand that. What, well, what world is he talking about? This world age, you know, it's good to have street smart so that you know what's happening out on the street, but better to be wise enough even with the smart street smarts to know you don't want any part of that. But it does give you an understanding of what the people are going through. But the, the, if you're a friend of this world, and a lot of preachers will do that, it'll be all right. Long as you come in and you come to church and bring your money and put it in the till, well, you'll be blessed. By who? By the world? Not by God. 
you have to you have to be familiar and well founded in the word of God to understand the love that brings forth from him and in yours in return. That's just the way it is. And our father is uh, so patient with his children. But I guarantee you, he does not want his children to be a friend of the world and an enemy to him. That's not why he created us. As it's written in the last verse of chapter four in the great book of Revelation, he created everything, including us, for his pleasure. If you're a friend of the world and his enemy, that does not pleasure him. He's jealous and has a right to be jealous for a child that will go the way of the world. Verse five, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth us to envy? Um, do, do, do you think that, um, that, that, you know, this, this comes forth and, and I, I like to know what's in the beginning and Revelation chapter six, you're not gonna have it, listen to me, verse five, listen to it. Way back in the beginning, this is when Noah and his children were being tempted by the fallen angels. Verse five of chapter six, the book of Genesis in the beginning. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's flesh. You gotta watch that, my friend. That's what he's talking about. Do you, do you think the scriptures teach that? Absolutely not. But they do forewarn you of what flesh can do to you or the ways of the world can do to you. Uh, if you enjoy that sort of thing, hey, have a good trip. Being an enemy of God doesn't endear you to him. So you're cut off. You've got no blessings. Maybe your life documents that. Verse six, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. That's the way it is. Grace is love and understanding and blessings and success. Peace of mind, heaven bound, eternal life, all those things right in your pocket to go with it. It's to love him. Don't fight God. It's a losing battle. And to chase after the, the ways of the world makes you what? An enemy of God. I cannot imagine who would want to be an enemy of the living God. I know one that is, it's Satan. And I don't think anyone wants to be in his camp. Verse seven, submit yourselves therefore to God. That's to our father. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And, and that's how it is. Do you know something? Christ gave us power over all of our enemies and in the great book of Luke in chapter 10, verse 18, gave us power over every enemy. That's why Satan will flee from you. If you order him out in the name of Jesus, it's dangerous for him. He is in danger. He is afraid of you. This is why I can't imagine how a good solid Christian founded in the word of God would ever be afraid of Satan because he shakes in his boots if you exercise the power and the authority that God has given you to exercise the rights and um, privileges of being a Christ man, Christian. The old devil and all his little demons will just, they'll run from you. That's why it is, well, that's, a, a real man or woman of God has no problem getting rid of e evil spirits, okay? For that reason, what? they tremble. Verse eight, draw nigh to God, good advice. And he will draw nigh to you. It's, it's wonderful. Cleanse your minds, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You, you that waver around, waver this way and that way and like blowing in the wind like a reed shaking rather than being solid and straight on. Gear up with the word of God in your mind whereby you 
do draw, well, how do I draw nigh to God? He sent you this letter. That's what this letter is all about, is knowing how to be pleasing to Him, whereby He can please you, whereby He can bless you. And to have the blessings of God is an awesome thing. Talk about power, endurance, and being blessed. That does it. You know, man, flesh man is the same. That's why I wanted to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. Nothing new under the sun. So how long does it take to learn a lesson? 6,000 years? Or can you sharpen up by just listening to the very Word of God that brings that atonement, being with Him, drawing you nearer to Him and He nearer to you? How blessed it is. Uh, let's go with the next verse, verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn. Be wretched and mourn if you want to, and, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Uh, 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. He always will. Do you, do you understand? That's a promise, and um, it is there. And it, 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 He will always do this. Humble yourself and He will lift you up. Give God the credit, for the credit is due. Do you know something? He's in charge. He's the judge. He's the creator. He's the boss of all things. So why wouldn't you humble yourself in His sight if you want His blessings, if you want His love? Eleven, speak not evil one of another, brethren. Watch your tongue. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. You know, now wait just a moment. I would think that would be bring about a heap of hurt if uh, you become a judge, why? Well, we've got one judge. Our judge is the Heavenly Father. Well, you don't understand, brother. I'm, I'm a special emissary of the living God, and I have the right to judge. Oh, well, where's that written? Because it's only written that we have one judge. So it would mean that you are trying to take God's place. And that's the way God looks at it. And if you ever want your gourd thumped real good, just set yourself up and start judging, well, this brother is this and this brother is that and this brother. Now, that, that has nothing to do with spiritual discernment and protecting your own safety and the church. But don't judge people. Judgment is judging whether someone's going to heaven or hell. You don't know ultimately when a person could have a miracle changed simply by loving the living God. Even a Kenite can be changed from a child of the devil to the child of the living God by loving the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the most dangerous things that man can partake upon and put upon himself is to decide to be a judge of people. You know, I'll just, we'll judge everyone. You'd be kidding yourself, and you'd be setting yourself up. You're getting on God's toes because there's only one judge, and that's our Heavenly Father. He does not like to be crowded in that respect. One of the greatest sins is to judge people. That's, that's written. God doesn't like it. And therefore, uh, all you're responsible for is taking this letter, the Word of God, living it as best you can, none of us are perfect, and, and hope and pray that it, it rubs off on the brethren that you can share that truth, giving God the credit and the due, and letting God be our Heavenly Father. Because regardless of what you set your mind as far as letting God be God, He's going to be God. Okay. That's, in the book. There's nothing you can do about that other than kid yourself. 
And, and so it is that our Father is on the throne. Do you know, do you know um, who the judge of judges is? Uh, it's written in Matthew chapter 10, verse um, 28. This, this is why you never, never want to try to judge yourself. Listen to it. And fear not them which kill the body, that's your flesh body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather, fear him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's what your father can do. He is the judge. You do not want to cross him. And what this means is, you know, do you understand what was said there from Matthew uh, 10? Is that your soul turns into nothing. He can destroy a soul. He can blot it out. You are never remembered anymore. You do not exist. He spoke and your soul came into being from nothing, and he can speak and your soul goes into nothing again. There's nobody going to shed a tear for you because they won't remember you even existed. That's the kind of judge he is, very final. It's always best to be a friend of God rather than a friend of the world. However, the choice is yours. Always has been, it always will be. Again, I, don't, I, I do not know how it could be made more important. Do not set yourself up as a judge. We have one and he is quite capable. Next verse, please. And verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. We just read about it. Who art thou that judgeth another? Who in the world do you think you are? You know, he is one that he is one that can not only cause the flesh body to die, if he so chose. You know, not new, too many people need help in that. They always arrange it themselves but one way or the other, whether breaking health laws, accidents, and so forth. But he can... Uh, uh, if, if he so wants to snuff, he can snuff. But the important thing is that he is the judge that can cause your soul to perish. Uh, beloved, that is serious. Because you could have had an eternity of peace, of love, of understanding, and of seeing this beautiful world put back in its original form where everything is perfect. What a beautiful place to be with the firmament back where it was. No more storms. The earth watered each night. No, no dry spells, no droughts. Earth watered each night by dew for what is sufficient to have fertile ground all around the world. North Pole, South Pole, East and West. What a beautiful thing. You don't want to miss that. And that's what you're flirting with when you try to judge and take the place of God. That's what, what you're doing. You don't want to go there because you're only a child of God. God will still be God. Yahweh will be Yahweh. And that's why he would call himself and the etymology of his name comes from I am that I am because he is. You don't ever want to try to question that and or change it. Verse 13 to continue. Go to now, or you come on now. Ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Well, we'll really, we'll have it made. You're going to leave God out of the equation? You're going to say, If God wills? Well, brother, you don't understand. A lot of the preachers say, if you only pray that God's will, then you're weak. And I tell you, if you pray without God's will, you're a little bit sluggish, okay? S sottish. Um, and I'm, because that's stupid. Our Father is in control. Never leave Him out of the equation especially if you're one of his elect. If you're one of his elect, he has, he has plans for you. And hopefully he can use you. 
that you are pliable like not old hard firm clay that cracks and breaks at every touch, but that is pliable and that God can use you and form you and shape you to bring peace to this world and to the minds of people whereby they can enjoy that wonderful heaven-bound trip. Uh, so, yeah, we're just taking over. We're going to plan. We're going down there and we're going to take the world over. Make, we're going to get rich, 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on to the morrow. You don't know what tomorrow brings. For what is your life? What, what is your soul? It belongs to God. All souls belong to God. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. You don't give your soul to God. He's got it. Okay. It is even a vapor. It's just like a mist. That's your very being. At least to him, it's like a mist. And appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. Vanisheth away. So uh, you want to be careful about leaving God out of the equation of your life. Let me put it a little different way. You don't want to go anywhere without God. 15. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If it be God's will. You know, don't ever let some would-be preacher tell you that shows a sign of weakness to say, well, I'd like to have this if it be his will. If you love God enough to know he knows all things and knows what tomorrow brings, you wouldn't want it if he didn't want you to have it. You would be more intelligent than that to know you only want what God wants you to have to accomplish what you must accomplish to do your part in consummating the end of this age, period. Always pray God's will. Have God in every equation that you bring forth. Verse 16, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. You want to be real careful, my friend. And you know, they don't even realize it. They really don't. One more verse to complete the chapter. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you know better. Many young people, when they don't know any better, commit some pretty bad sins. They get in trouble and then they have to get out of trouble and in ignorance they do this. That's forgivable. Why? They didn't know. But when you know better and you still commit that, then it is a sin. So what, what is he saying? Don't leave God out of the equation of your life. You know better. Don't leave him out. Ask that he bless you and be with you. Pray and ask his leading and direction. And always take him with you. You know, draw near to him and have him draw near to you. Always take him with you. And you'll be a lot better off. Don't miss the next lecture. We'll complete this book in Jesus. So listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146. The first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately. And you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar. For if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are, back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. I think today's lecture kind of shows you why it's not wise to judge 
Um, judge lest you be judged. Uh, leave that in the Father's hands. He loves to do it. Uh, and uh, why? Because he knows even what people think. He's qualified for it. We're not necessarily, but you are qualified to spiritually discern if you have the gift of God. Never be ashamed to use that discernment. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. All the way around the world, He knows. What does He want from you? Your love. Let Him know that you love Him. Won't you do that? That's a good start to prayer every time. Father, I love you. And let that love return to you. Be pleasing to Him. And always bring Him into the equation of your life. Father, we do so as we come to the throne. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to get right into it. Karen from Michigan. We know the time of the locust is May through September, which is five months. We know Satan has a five-month period on earth. Does that mean Satan will bring his locust army in May? Does that mean Satan will only come in May? Or will it be a five-month period? It, it will be a five-month period, but you've got to remember there's four stages of the locust. You've got to know which stage you're in before you start counting five months. And a watchman is supposed to watch. In this coming week, you're going to hear that five-month period brought up and act exactly what is happening concerning the locust in the world today, where it will put all the loose ends basically together for you about what's happening in the Middle East, in, in um, Syria, Egypt, Bahrain, and uh, in uh, Libya. All these countries, Iran, it will all kind of nail together for you. Don't miss next week when you hear those Passover messages. And uh, it will, I, I, I just know you'll be blessed in understanding the sieges of the locust. Kim from Germany, um, since my husband passed away unexpectedly in January, I have found myself in such so much turmoil from the things my German husband has never told me. I'm finding myself r being really mad at him. Now, you know, no one, when it's unexpected especially, no one plans to pass away. So they, you know, a husband always tries to, I'm, and I, I don't know as much maybe as I should, but I can only say he always tries to protect his wife and maybe holds some things, d handles things that he, feels he's better qualified to handle, and then poof, he's gone. And, and, but it's not his fault that he didn't do that. It was because he loved you that he protected you. My question, is it wrong for me to be so mad at my husband for the situation in which he left me? Does God understand feelings? I have asked God to forgive me and also my husband. I thank God for you and your staff. Well, well hon, you can forgive him. He did not know. And maybe he did not know or understand what you're up against now or to give you information concerning the end times. And not being familiar with the situation. But let God lead you. Pray and bring God into the equation. And let peace come into your mind, dear one. And know that he's striving and would strive to help you in every way that he can. So, so be, let peace come into your life, and you're going to do just fine. Why, would I, why can I say that? Because you'd have God with you. And if God is with you, who can be against you? doesn't matter. Uh, okay, we're going to go with uh, Rita from Canada. My question is, are the 144,000 alive today, or are they already passed? I know they are from each tribe, but... Somehow, I am confused about this. Uh, please help me. Well, it's, it's real simple. Revelation chapter 7, what, how does that chapter begin? A certain, the four winds are about ready to, to blow. That means that's the end of the world, okay, this world age. When the four winds blow, it's over. And this strong angel appears and says, Stop! 
don't let the end come yet, for we have to seal the 144,000. That's to say, they put the seal of God in the minds of the people. So they were living at this time, and the sealing is the teaching of God's Word that goes into the minds of people to let them know who they are, what they are, who God is, and what He expects from them. Uh, Kim from Kentucky. Pastor Murray, my children attend a different church than I believe, and they want to be baptized in that, their church. And the baptism belief is the same as I believe. Is it all right for me to support them in doing this? Well, I, I would by all means. There is only one baptism, and that is to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as those children know they're bab being baptized and saying publicly, I believe Jesus Christ went into the tomb, that's under the water, and that He resurrected into eternal life, then it, it doesn't matter. Any Christian can baptize another Christian. And, but in that church, I, I, see, I certainly see nothing wrong with it. I would certainly never, ever say anything against it. And I'm going to tell you why. If you were to stand against that baptism, and unfortunately if something in a week or two should happen to one of those children, you would probably never forgive yourself because they would have passed on unbaptized. So I, if I were you, I would thank God that they want to be baptized and that would be the completion. Charles from South Carolina. Pastor Murray, will the Antichrist show up after the millennium reign? That's a good question. Will the Antichrist show up at the end of the millennium reign? Answer, no. He will not show up at the end of the millennium. Well, why won't he? Well, read Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. What does it say? Revelation chapter 19, verse 20 states, at when, when this age of the Antichrist, right before the millennium, the, both the one world government system and the Antichrist, the false prophet himself, both of those offices, only the offices now, are cast into the lake of fire, meaning they don't exist anymore. So naturally the answer to your question is, is when Satan is released a short season, he will not be afforded either of those roles to deceive people. All he has is his own two legs to stand on and to deceive people. He will not be given those powers or that authority. Why? Revelation chapter 19, verse 20 explains it. It's gone. Uh, Bobby from Indiana. Pastor Murray, where can I find in the Bible that God is against those that teach my people to fly? Isn't it amazing how many times I get that question? Ezekiel chapter 13, read verse 20. And take in the whole thing, and I always say this, it's God saying, you sow those kerchiefs or pillows to cover every digit of my outreach saving arms and teach my children to fly to save their souls by Satan. That's exactly what it means. And that's why he says, I'm against it. And yet people will do it. Sad. And it comes down to the fact of the sixth and the seventh trump then those people are not taught, that are taught to fly, that Satan comes at the sixth trump and Christ doesn't return till the seventh. So they hop in the sack with Satan and then expect to be a virgin when the true Christ returns? Forget it. I'm speaking spiritually, of course. Martha from Mississippi. As Christians, how can we believe in capital punishment? Please give me scripture for this. Well, as Christians, how can you not believe in capital punishment? If some pervert rapes, molests, let's say a 12-year-old girl, kills her, murders her, what do you want to do? Send him roses? You, you want to send him a love letter? Or do you want to turn him loose and let him do it again? You want to better listen to God. What does God say to do about it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Write it down. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Christ said, Thou shalt not kill. You've read that. Well, what does that word kill mean in the Greek? It is phonyons. Criminal homicide. A murderer. 
will perish. That's what he says. I don't change one jot of the law. Well, what does the law say? In that same chapter, fifth chapter, I don't change one. I don't even change a little dot that changes the sound of a letter A from A to A. Okay. That's not much. Okay. He doesn't change the law. It stays the same. And yet people will teach, the law doesn't exist anymore. Well, I'm afraid it does. Rob a bank and see what happens to you. Thou shalt not steal. You'll be locked up for a long time. Don't go do it, all right? You don't, you're smarter than that. Then you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and find out if somebody lies in wait wickedly and evenly, evilly, without a passion, without a crime of passion. That makes a big difference. You're supposed to execute them one way or the other. Why? God wants them up there. Why? Well, why would God want them up there? Because the person they murdered is up there waiting for the real trial. Uh, does that mean they're going to hell? Not necessarily. Um, we're not supposed to judge. Let God do the judging according to what happens up there. So in, naturally, a Christian must demand capital punishment. Well, why would he want to do that? God's advice. You will do this. You will send them to me, meaning execute them, and others will see and fear, and these things will cease happening among you. As long as we let it continue happening without, it's going to keep happening. And many people will say, well, that's not a deterrent. I'll tell you what. You let somebody, if you catch somebody that rapes a 12-year-old girl, cut their head off and see if they do it again. Okay, see if that deters their ability to be a pervert again. Uh, Ronald, I, I may upset some people, but hey, don't you, don't, we want to protect our young people better than that. Haven't we got compassion from Almighty God to want to protect the little ones from perverts? I think so. Ronald from Michigan, hi pastor, I love watching your program. Well, thank you. Can you please explain the part of the Bible that says one will be taken and one will be left? Everyone says that you want to be the first one taken. And this shows you how misleading people can be. You know something? A child can read Matthew 24. Christ was asked, how is it going to be at your return and the events that consummate the end of this age? And he gives all seven things, that seven seals, seven trumps, and seven vials. He gives all seven of them in that 24th chapter of Matthew, warning you that you will be delivered up before the Antichrist. To not, if they say he's in the field, don't go. In other words, don't be the first one taken because it's the fake. It's the Antichrist. And you will be delivered up. You will not premeditate what you will say, but you will speak what the Holy Spirit gives you in that hour. That's the whole purpose is teaching God's word before the false Messiah. So naturally, then one is, is um, commanded, stay in the field working. Don't fly off to boom, boom land with Satan. You know, this is why that Christ would say when when Christ returns, a lot of these so-called religious people, flyaways, will come say, oh, Jesus, Jesus, we healed in your name. What? He said, you get away from me. I don't know you. Never knew you. If you don't teach God's word in truth, he doesn't want anything to do with you. You can't be a false teacher and expect God's blessings. It's that simple. Robert, well, you know, some might say, well, isn't that a, just a little rough and being judgmental? No, that's what the Word says. And it's better maybe to be a little rough on the edges, edges, that's tough love and save souls, than it is to let people deceive themselves into hell? I think so. Robert from Florida, please explain the three world ages and where in the Bible this is talked about. Basically, throughout the Word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period, millions of years ago. And then in verse 2 in the Hebrew manuscripts, then the earth became void, and wasn't created void, became void and without form. That's when the overthrow of Satan came, and then this particular age came into being. Second Peter chapter 3 gives you all three heaven ages and earth ages. 
There's only one heaven, there's only one earth, but there are different ages of time. Uh, Pastor Murray, this is Di um, Roger from Arkansas. Thank you so much for your teaching. Can you still go to heaven if you're not one of God's elect? Absolutely. If you were a Kenite and loved the Lord Jesus Christ, whomsoever will, you're saved. You can, you're heaven bound. Uh, God's elect are not any more special than anyone else. It's just that in the first earth age, they stood against Satan, and God knows he can trust them to stand against him again. And they're going to at the, at the sixth trump when Satan appears as Antichrist. Uh, piece of cake, okay? No step for a stepper. Uh, uh, Marcy from New Mexico. I am so glad my brother told me about you. Well, well I am too. Thank you, dear. I would like to know where in the Bible it tells you about murder and just killing about the Ten Commandments. Well, the, the, I just answered that uh, about capital punishment, so I'll let that pass and I'll just answer where the Ten Commandments are. You will find the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. It's good to have you with us. Uh, Mitch from Florida. I've often heard you say that this is an incorrect translation. It really means such and such. If God inspired the Bible when it was originally written, why didn't he similarly inspire the translators so they could get it right for, for those of us who do not speak Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek? Surely he knew that languages would change over time and these languages would not be um, prevalent in the world. I was sure he knew it. That's why he sends teachers. But, uh, you know, in the, we have a copy of the original 1611 in our library that people can order. I do not recommend it as a study Bible. I recommend it for one simple reason, is where a person can have a look at it, but at the same time to read the letter by the translators to the reader so that you know they warn you. We've done our best. Check us out. Okay. And I'm going to tell you, any good scholar will do that. Any good scholar is going to say, check me out, but, but uh, 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 it's good to study, but check me out. Make sure. Decide for yourself. Uh, um, languages, Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, um, one word can have more than one meaning, just like in, in the English. Um, English is not a solid stationary language as those others are. It changes from, um, from one day to the other, basically, uh, and by figures of speech, metaphors, and, and so forth. But uh, God sent you the ability. That's why I recommend the Strong's Concordance the Smith's Bible Dictionary, those were two scholars that were excellent in those languages that we were speaking of. But at the same time, you know what they would tell you? Check us out. That's what God wants you to do. God can give you the unction to intuitively. Once you check it out in the languages to determine what it means to you, always study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the Word of God. Joanne from Ohio, in one of your answers to a question the other day, you said Esau was hated by God before he was in the womb. Does that mean you believe in reincarnation? If so, can you explain why? No, I do not believe in reincarnation. I do believe there was an earth age before this one. That's why uh, God hated Esau. This is why that God would say, let us create man in our image, that we were all with him. And as it is written in the 38th chapter of Job, we were all with him and rejoiced uh, in the first earth age. That's why in, when wisdom speaks in Proverbs chapter 8, it says, in the beginning, wisdom talking. When God created the sons of men, that means he created us all at the same time, basically. We're all the same age. That throws some people, but be that as it may, spiritually speaking. 
But uh, that is, there are three earth ages. Second Peter chapter three documents it. That is not reincarnation. Jim from Ohio. The other day you made reference to the third world and also the third heavens. Can you, three heavens, can you please? Times, eons. Check out the word uh, as it is used, three worlds in the worlds in uh, Second Peter chapter three. And the word in the Greek manuscripts for worlds is eon, okay? Time, it's different, three different time periods, but the same earth, the same heaven. Rick from Alabama. How do you feel about prosperity ministers where they don't teach one bit of God's word but just demand money? My grandmother died giving money from her Social Security check to a ministry like this. I am asking you for a straight answer. Thank you. Well, my answer is, as always, um, when God sent forth the 70, he said, whatever you do, don't take a begging bag. Okay. And anytime you have somebody begging for money, God didn't send them. Uh, and that may offend some people, but that's just the way it is. If anybody's begging for money, God didn't send them. God, when you teach God's word and you are worthy, God will see that the, that the, the ministry is supported. You're not supposed to ask and or beg. And right now, I beg you to let me go because I am out of time again. We love, I love you because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. You understand that? God loves you for it. Makes His day when you read His letter. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always again. He will bless you. Now, most important though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in His Word every day. In His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.